Hello traders, it's Saturday, October the 8th. This is John Kick, letter chief strategist for dailyfx.com, here to give you a market wrap of the past trading week, and more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in the trading week ahead of us. An overview, we ended up pretty much where we started off the uh, week, month, and quarter. Now, I keep reiterating week, month, and quarter because I do think that a lot of the, the momentum that we had to start off that period uh, was anchored in the seasonality effect, the expectations that were redistributing capital and not just the expectations, the actual redistribution of the capital uh, after taxing, uh, tax and accounting actions. Uh, and that means that there's going to have to be a deployment of capital usually towards a, buy, uh, a buying action. And it did uh, see a significant rally in the markets, the major U.S. indices and other risk-oriented assets. But that run did not last. Fundamentals that have been plaguing us throughout 2022, and by some degree getting worse, pulled us right back down. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to continue with great momentum. Uh, it's been some very choppy markets, but there are a lot of circumstances that can turn it on in terms of the momentum. So, Without further ado, since we had plenty of time on this risk disclaimer, let's start talking about what the week ahead has to offer. And a lot of that's going to be rooted in where we've been this past week, particularly the second half of this past week. Taking a look at uh, the traction that we lost uh, and the progression there, this is the S&P 500, one of my preferred measures of uh, imperfect risk. Uh, that's because it is convenient, but in that convenience, you lose a lot of the nuance uh, that can tell you more of the big picture. Nevertheless, the progression. We started off with the October 3rd, the Monday rally that was followed through on Tuesday. We knew something was wrong. However, after that enormous, uh, on a two-day basis, it was a incredible 5.7% rally. All right. Now, we knew something was wrong the subsequent Wednesday, uh, day on Wednesday uh, when we had a gap to the downside. And while it recovered a significant amount of that lost ground, it still was a struggle. Uh, Thursday was some progression to the downside. Again, a, another bearish gap uh, and an inside day, which means the uh, high and the low of that session fit neatly within the previous session, usually an indication of uncertainty uh, and uh, anticipation. And that anticipation could be wrapped up into a key event risk, which was non-farm payrolls, which we'll talk a little bit about today because it does feed into the bigger picture. Uh, but as you can see, it was a sizable decline. For the S&P 500, it's 2.8%. Uh, it's generally going to be bigger on the more active uh, NASDAQ 100. It was 3.9%. Uh, but I thought most interesting at the end of the day was the Dow. All right, 2.1% percent decline, significant. Uh, but this is the blue chip index. It was late to the party to actually flip to a bear market. That took a uh, late September to actually achieve that. Whereas for the S&P 500, it was in June and the NASDAQ 100 did, did it much earlier. This is kind of the uh, picture of a market of stability where it gives that veneer. Now, if the entire market is struggling, then stability is going to be as good as uh, what the backdrop offers. But I thought more interesting in this was the profile of that reversal on a larger time frame. All right, we are moving into the 41st week of the year, but we closed out the 40th week of the year. So in terms of performance, take a look at the scope of that reversal. So strong charge, aggressive reversal. And that would leave what we call a wick or a tail. Uh, that is an indication of intraperiod reversal. And you can see a lot of these wicks mostly to the uh, downside until we uh, finally did significantly break lower. Uh, that's an indication that the market is not willing to make that move. So for the downside, it was not willing to continue, and it subsequently found its run after the pandemic. Of course, it's not always going to happen uh, with such clean um, response. That was a heightened volatility market, and yes, volatility is still heightened, but this is much more uh, stable than we had back during the height of the pandemic. Uh, and I have to say that historically, it is impressive that this tail uh, this is, of course, not a um, tail or a wick um, as a percentage of price, but it's just generally a tail. 
it is the second biggest, because uh, we saw a little bit of a rebound at the end of the day, uh, the second biggest since what we had back here on March, uh, the week of the March, March the 2nd, 2020. All right, so it was a essentially a record breaking outside of that one instance reversal. All right, so it is remarkable that your only context was a period of extreme volatility, extreme uncertainty. It was a forced shutdown because of the global pandemic. That's not really what you want to look for in comparison to what would be a more stable, hopefully stoic market that can control its issues. And that leads me to some concern because the systemic issues that we're facing now in our current circumstances uh, are starting to uh, find sparks in the seasonality, just the averages, the norms. And we've talked a lot about this because they can be at times guidelines and at times amplifiers. And we're in a kind of a concerning position to find amplifiers. All right. So in terms of the expectations for what we're getting into, historically speaking, the 30, 41st week of the year is usually the peak. And this is breaking it down by week, uh, going all the way back uh, to when the VIX began trading or was uh, officially uh, monitored in 1990. Uh, so you don't have, this doesn't necessarily have to be the peak this year. We're still below our peak that we had seen earlier this year. Uh, but it is historically the norm. Those expectations will be set very high. This also happens to carry the expectations of October. October historically is the peak of volume and uh, volatility for the S&P 500. And for the S&P 500, breaking it down on a weekly basis, the 41st through the 43rd week of the year, which we're entering, traditionally averages a loss. Now, again, do not go by what the average uh, changes are. Point in case, this past week, the 40th week of the year, is typically the oasis of a gain uh, in an average 0.3% uh, uh, around six weeks, three weeks preceding, three weeks after of losses. This is not very comforting in these same terms. Technically, it was a gain of 1.5%. But it doesn't give you the context of uh, confidence. And if those expectations, those seasonal expectations, uh, play out um, in the same way, it could cause problems, especially, again, with the circumstances that we have currently. Now, there are some very important uh, updates that we're going to get in the week ahead. Uh, and it starts and was reinforced by a lot of Fed speak, in particular this past week, a statement uh, or update from the IMF, uh, and also the non-farm payrolls. So the non-farm payrolls this past uh, session, Friday, came across the wires uh, better than expected, right? by the slimmest margin, uh, 13,000 additional jobs uh, than was officially the econ economist consensus. It was 250,000 jobs. Net addition was projected. We got 263. All right, so two months of just very small, quote-unquote, beats. And that should, uh, air quotes there, should dampen the market's response. And this was a market that was highly tuned to what was going to happen in the non-farm payrolls because there was good data, bad data, and in-line data. Good was the service sector ISM uh, employment component. Bad was the uh, job openings from JOLTS or the manufacturing PMIs employment component. And in-line was the ADP numbers. So it could have gone any way, and it came in line with expectations. But again, that would not stop the, the, the S&P 500, sorry, from uh, tumbling. In fact, if you go to a continuous contract, trades after hours, this is the response after those non-farm payrolls hit. Context is everything. Context is everything. A lot of people will look at this and say, fundamentals don't work. But I look at this and say, absolutely, that's, that's what we should expect. Why? Because you have an inline number for employment, all right? And what it says is that the Fed's dual mandate, which is uh, helpfully uh, summarized here in chart form, between 
pursuing the lowest rate of unemployment to natural employment possible, uh, and controlling inflation at a norm uh, that is close to the 2% target that they uh, officially have. Uh, is there a dual mandate? Well, the employment component, which is the blue, is in line. The inflation element is far out of line. And our interest rates are still very low, gray here, historically speaking. So what are they going to do with this mix? They're going to target inflation. So it reinforces the, uh, the focus. The probability of a 75 base point rate hike, the fourth consecutive 75 base point rate hike in a row uh, at the November 2nd meeting is now up to 80%. All right, and that is a burden for risk-leading assets, uh, the sens sensitivity to uh, financing rates, uh, and it is also a boon for the dollar, the dollar which re uh, clawed back its uh, losses, uh, just like the S&P 500 gave back its gains. All right, so that focus is what we should be honing in on. That monetary policy, but I'm not necessarily as interested in the monetary policy, uh, policy itself. Um, Interest rate expectations can be a, a key driver for something like uh, Euro USD, the tempo between the two of them. Dollar Yen is specifically a problem here because its monetary policy contrasts are not measured in nuance. Uh, the nuance, even for the ECB to the Fed, is, all right, where are they going to end up at the end of the year? Where are they going to end up in 2023? The ECB intends to hike and is still ex expected to hike between 100 and 125 base points at its next meeting, according to swaps. The Fed is expected to hike at 75 base points at its next meeting, like I just showed you. Um, so it's, it, there's some comparison, there's some gray area, but it is black and white when it comes to the Fed's tightening and the Bank of Japan's refusal to tighten, or the PBOC's refusal to tighten, that's the Chinese Central Bank. And the result is dollar yen hammering up at that 145 level, actually moving above it. And that same level or that zone was what inspired uh, the Bank uh, of Japan, uh, really it's the Ministry of Finance that made the Bank of Japan do it, uh, but to intervene on behalf of the Japanese yen, to try to push it up or push the dollar yen lower. Didn't really work well. And it's not going to work well, most likely, going forward because... This is just too large of a capital flow. They're fighting the entire market, and they're fighting a big monetary policy shift for the vast majority of the world. The same pressures exist with the dollar CNH. Um, I am very confident that they intervene on behalf of the yuan, but they wouldn't say so at the 720 mark. Um, but given that they uh, obfuscate what they're doing, uh, they, they can maintain control. Dollar yen is... Uh, the Japanese officials are, have been very transparent, and subsequently, the markets have transparently said, you've lost control. So the comparisons matter, but I, I care about it more on a bigger picture scheme, um, the, the global picture. And the global picture can be an influence on economic activity. So this is stimulus versus the S&P 500. Um, you can also look at stimulus versus uh, GDP potential, although uh, the pace of economic growth uh, continue to decline in terms of every dollar, euro, pound, yen of stimulus pumped into the system approximately around 2014. So that stimulus went instead to asset inflation, not necessarily goods inflation and certainly not to GDP. And now we're reaping uh, the uh, fallout from that policy draft. All right. In terms of the economic activity, we are starting to see a, or we are continuing to slide into e economic malaise. And the problem is going to be even worse uh, than it was at the last update. This is the update from the IMF, um, who does a semi annual, uh, well, they do official World Economic uh, Outlook updates. Uh, every six months, April and October. Uh, the mid-year update is coming in this coming week, and it's going to be a change relative to the interim periods update. Uh, we actually had an interim update in, in July, which is what you see here. So the world economic outlook for 2022 is 3.2% and 2.9% for 2023. Here's the United States, which even from April to July suffered a big drop in growth forecast. China, same thing. 
big drop in growth forecast. Now we want to see what happens at this uh, further update. And that's going to be on the docket at uh, on Tuesday. Okay, at 13.30 GMT. That is going to be a critical event for me. Or sorry, 1300 GMT. Now, this is not my greatest concern, however. I am concerned long term about economic activity because this, this unfolds over a very long period of time. And it can grind down expansion, it can grind down financial markets, and it takes a long time to recover from. But if there is a slow, a slow spreading fire and you're in a home versus a quick flash fire in your home, which one do you worry about first? All right, you worry about the flash fire first. And my concern is increasingly shifting towards financial stability. Now, I mentioned last week we had a number of updates or reports or remarks uh, that warned about financial stability, including uh, one that came from the Federal Reserve. Uh, or sorry, the IMF. Uh, the IMF uh, mentioned the risk to financial stability in a uh, prepared statement that precedes the official Global Financial Stability Report on Tuesday. We also had a number of Fed officials uh, this past week warn, even the doves. Kashkari, I mentioned this past week because he was one of the most dovish members through 2021. And now he's saying that there are signs of financial cracks, or expects them, uh, and that's not going to that's not going to turn the Fed off of its pace of normalization. All right, that's a concern, but that's not necessarily that big of a surprise because we've seen intervention, we've seen distortions, in exchange rates, uh, we've seen fallout from fiscal policies that don't match up to the debt loads that, that are out there. Uh, point in case is the UK economic situation in response to the mini budget uh, just a, over a week ago. All right, these issues are starting to compound. Now, the Global Financial Stability Report does not have any kind of layout in terms of here's the exact number. It is just a statement of warning. And those can be abstract. Uh, the markets don't necessarily have to see the VIX surge to 50 because they say we're more worried. But this is an environment in, there's, in which there's a, a much greater sensitivity. There's an awareness of the troubles. All right? And there aren't many great measures uh, to, to give us a leading indication of problems, which is my uh, lament. Uh, there are plenty of other issues that I've shown out there that uh, include uh, the dependency on monetary policy and how that can cause problems for us in the future. Uh, there is this. This is NICE leverage. Uh, leverage is actually high um, pretty much across every uh, major economic category, meaning markets, uh, businesses, institutions, and, co and corporations, uh, consumers, governments, central banks. That is problematic. Because as these costs rise of this leverage, then the subsequent impact on that is amplified. All right. So, and you don't really have a good place to shift leverage from one segment to the another uh, to another segment, which historically happens in financial crises. The leverage shifts the capital. And where is it going to go now? So. We have some more systemic issues that uh, I believe the markets are paying more attention to, they're more aware of, and that means that we need to be mindful. The VIX, uh, again, uh, I, I think the VIX is a, hits something uh, akin to capitulation, meaning we flush the market of its short-term worries all at once at about the 50 mark. That's not scientific by any stretch, but that's what I'm, I'm keeping a tab on. If it continues to rise slowly or stay within this... Uh, 20 to 35, 40 uh, zone, then it's going to probably be just a progressive uh, decline, depreciation of assets. It's not going to just simply stop uh, after a great flush like it did after the great financial crisis. But if we do have that, there are levels along here that we can watch for. And from the S&P 500, 3500 or 3505 technically uh, is the midpoint of the post-pandemic run from the low in 2020 to the high in 2021, at the end of 2021. I'll be watching that. I'll be watching risk across the board. I want to know what happens in European stocks. All right, that's the DAX, and this is the FTSE, the Nikkei 225. 
I want to see what happens to emerging markets, which are already under significant pressure, or junk bonds, HYG, under significant pressure. Carry trade is also of great interest and has deviated because the yield differential specifically benefits here or offsets. But risk aversion is a scourge that's not going to be stopped by small returns. And these are still historically small yield, and they don't offset the risk that it represents. All right. So very high profile themes that we need to keep tabs on. And there's a lot of event risk. Uh, take a look at the economic docket. Tons of central bank speak. Tons of it. Fed, ECB, BOE in particular. We have employment statistics from the UK. We have quite a bit of UK data, in fact. We have more OPEC updates. Uh, we have uh, US CPI, a key event risk, because it shows the pressure uh, behind the Fed. But ultimately, all of this, and this also includes earnings. Um, I almost forgot to mention that. Earnings begins for the quarter with the banks on Friday, starting with JP Morgan. That's definitely something you're going to be watching. But some of the most important event risk is usually not a well-known market mover, but it's thematic, and it taps into the deep veins of worry that these markets have. All right, so prepare for it. Mark it all down in your calendar so you're, you know what, when to look for market volatility as it may arise around event risk. All right, we'll wrap it up there. We'll do our next rundown of these markets next week. Until then, I wish you all good luck trading out there, and I hope you have a great weekend.